Okay, call the meeting to order. Good evening, class. Yeah, Welcome to the, to the <laughs> BUHS board, October 19th, 2015 meeting being held in science room 233 as we have a presentation from the science department. So first question is, did, did everybody get their homework done? <laughs> yes, sir. If so, would you please pass it in to Ms. Hood? <laughs> now it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting us and we're looking forward to the presentation. We will have you on the agenda quite quickly. But we should start with the clerk's report first and we need to approve the minutes of our October 5th meeting. Is there a motion? I move the minutes of October 5th as presented. Second. Okay, Ricky. I heard a second. Lori. Lori, okay. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to the October 5th minutes? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes of October 5, 2015, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed or abstentions? Abstain. 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 Yes, Ruth and Laurie abstain. With that, okay. okay. All right, the minutes are passed. Communications? Communications? No? If not, is there anything else for the clerk's report? Okay, we will move on to recognition of groups and or individual visitors. And we have quite a few faces over there representing the science department and we'll turn it over to you. Great. You introduce your others as appropriate. Thank you. Go right ahead. So I'm Michelle Hood and I would like to, to welcome and thank you for coming to our science department this evening to, to look through the window and see a little bit of the work that we're doing in our new ninth grade um, next generation earth and space science course. With your 1% support this past summer and with the critical leadership of Scott Norn, our local expert, and the input of our teachers in the science department, we've uh, created a new course that we believe is well aligned with the next generation science standards and uh, the um, that honors the shift to proficiency-based learning that our students are experiencing. With me tonight are Scott Noring, Ben Lord, and Dan, Dan Braden, all of whom helped create the rubrics that underlie the course that the rest of us used to write the curriculum that we are now um, delivering for the first time. Scott and Ben are both current teachers of the Next Generation Earth and Space Science course. So I will now turn the meeting over to Ben Lord, who will be leading you in an activity analyzing the relationship between mass and weight. Hi, everyone. Uh, so excuse me, I'm going to turn off an overhead projection here, if I may. And um, if you can't see, feel free to adjust yourself so that you can get a sense of this is, as a quick introduction to we are. I just want to set the stage a little bit. Um, you know, step into our time machine and travel back to when you were a ninth grader, perhaps. Um, and I imagine coming back into uh, the high school and going through the experiences of you know going from class to class and, and enjoying a science class here. The uh, context that this particular lesson falls into is when we were investigating um, space systems. And uh, one of the key things that we're looking at here are the uh, dynamics of how planets orbit each other, uh, orbit bodies in space. And as you might imagine, key to that idea is gravity. And so we might start off with a story about Isaac Newton, because everyone knows, like, he sat under the apple tree, right? And the apple fell, and he was like, oh, yeah, gravity, as if things falling was like some great discovery. And <laughs> Um, it takes a, a bit, actually, to realize that um, it's not actually that he saw the apple falling, like in the picture on the left. It's that, um, and you know, this is a, an apocryphal story anyway, but, but it's about the, well, the apple falling to the earth, but the moon doesn't. That was the really puzzling question that Newton was able to figure out. And so um, when introducing this, we've, by this point in the class, we've already kind of talked a little bit about the patterns that 
scientists have seen in how things work and gravity is now and and Newton's explanation of how all that happens is going to come in to provide us with a reason why it is that the planets do the funny things that they do. Um, oops. There we go. So um, if gravity is so important, how do we go about measuring it? Well, you know, we must have some scientific uh, gravity detecting device out there. So, um, and indeed we do, and probably all of you are familiar with a gravity detecting device that you use in your home, maybe perhaps in your bathroom. The scale is a gravity detecting and gravity measuring device. Um, and so the actual force of gravity is what we call weight. And um, so weight is measured in the non-science world in ounces and pounds. Those are the things that most Americans would be familiar with. But um, since weight is a force, in this case, or weight is a measure of a force, we'll measure it in Newtons, named after the apple guy. And um, we use a scale. And basically, a scale is like a, it's a spring. So we can step on our bathroom scale, and as the spring compresses, we get a, a sense of how much force it's taking to press that down, and so we can measure it. All right, um, and so uh, if you have transported yourself back to like where you are in ninth grade, maybe you're thinking of uh, you know Mrs. Burbank and um, all of that, and she and she would spend all this time with me on like the difference between mass and weight. And, but really, like, what's the difference? What does it really matter, right? Mass and weight, they're kind of the same thing. You arrive into, I arrive in the ninth grade science class, probably with a conception along those lines that, you know, heavy things are heavy, light things are light. What does it really matter what you call it? These science people are really hung up on a lot of the vocab. Why do we care about a difference between these two words? Um, and to give a sense of this, a very common tactic that um, science teachers have used in the past is to say, uh, let's do a thought experiment. We're going to take you right now, we're going to put you on a bathroom scale on the earth, and we're going to weigh you here. And um, since we're, we have a scientific and uh, uh, bathroom scale, we're going to measure in newtons. And so your weight in earth would be 560 newtons, perhaps. Now, in this thought experiment, we take you to the moon, and we put you there, and we figure out that, oh, actually, on the moon, you now have a weight that's different. Well, that makes sense. The moon is less gravity, so I go to the moon, and my weight is only 90 newtons, say. Uh, but here is the critical difference. And this is what Miss Burbank trying, she kept trying to drive home for me, is that my mass will stay the same, no matter where I was that my mass would always be 56 kilograms. That this measure of how much of me there was didn't change. Even though the amount of gravity that I was experiencing, the force of gravity that I was experiencing did. So um, it, at the beginning of this activity, students will be coming in with this brand new conception that mass is how much of me there is, how much stuff I'm composed of. And my weight is the force of gravity that is acting on me. And, uh, you know, at this point, I probably get a lot of nods in the classroom being like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's different. Yeah, I get that. So if at this point it's, we have this sense of difference between mass and weight, um, then the next question is, why is it so easy to confuse them? Right? So mass is not measured with a scale, it's measured on a balance. Weight's measured on a scale. Mass is the amount of matter. And weight is how strong that force of gravity is. Mass is measured in grams. Weight is what measured in newtons. So is there something going on between mass and weight that makes it so difficult to tease out? Which is where we would begin this activity with this kind of question. Um, and so what I'd like to do is give you an opportunity to experience um, a, uh, a way of answering that question, uh, a way of, of looking at the world to, to puzzle that out. 
So um, I have here, and oh, thank you. I have here um, uh, a copy of a lab, which would probably take us a whole block to go through and talk about, but we're going to try and do it within just a few minutes. So if you want to take one of these, go ahead and pass it on down um, so that everyone gets one. Oh, we're going to skip through the warm-up. We're not going to have you write out any questions necessarily. And in fact, we're going to modify the procedure that we're doing here some, because this procedure would entail you actually finding the mass of these little objects here. But <laughs> fortunately for us, um, we've already painstakingly um, measured the masses of each of these and etch them uh, onto the surface. Okay, we didn't actually painstaking the mass. We bought them that way. But, um, <laughs> but we, have, we have already a mass measurement that someone used a balance <coughs> to determine. And so what I'd like you guys to do is to break up into groups of four and you can find yourself a space in the lab, and you will find at that space in the lab, in addition to a bunch of objects, which have all been masked, you will find a gravity detecting device here, which is basically a spring. And you'll notice that on one side has a capital letter G, or a, oh, sorry, lowercase g on one side, but we're not gonna use that because we're gonna be measuring weight. So you're gonna look for the side that has an N on it. And uh, you may also want to look carefully at this spring scale to adjust the nut up at the top here so that you can line up and calibrate your scale here by lining up that little plastic disc with the zero. And then as you go through, what you're going to be doing is uh, recording, oops, wrong side, <laughs> is recording Try again. The relationship between mass and weight. So uh, we're going to give you some graph paper, and you can set uh, up a little table for yourself with um, mass on one side, the weight of the object on the other. And keep in mind your question, your purpose here, is to figure out why it's so confusing to have mass and weight be separate things um, by looking for a relationship between them. Okay, so give me a thumbs up if you feel like you understand the directions of this assignment. Okay, fantastic, great. So um, if you find yourself around, I'll pass out some graph paper for us and we can get started. Do you guys want to be a group here or four? Did anyone put their thumbs up when we asked if we understood? You're a coward. I'll give you the best. I didn't agree with somebody who knows that. That's why that's why you're that's why you got a college professor. Great. Where are we going? Individual work from well, that, that doesn't do anything either. I mean, I it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, number is that? This is 20. 20. I mean, can you, 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 you're the one data, and that's all right. Well, I always like to sign. Let's talk about a relationship between mass and volume. If any. Now, if, if this were a full block length class, um, we'd have you doing the graphing yourself here and constructing the graph so that you could find the, the relationship um, yourselves. But when we have, um, with the short time that we have, let's see if we can make sense of this together. Um, can somebody give me, oh, remind me, what's the maximum mass? that we're dealing with in this experiment? 1,000. 1,000 grams, okay. So we want, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be imprecise here in a way that I wouldn't normally be in class just for the sake of time. So I'm going to divide this up into about 10 equal, uh, 10 equal spaces down this range. That is not 10, is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, oh, almost 10. 
Okay? So 20, 40, 60, 100. Whoops, I miscounted. Yet again. We are. Now, um, what was the maximum weight in newtons that folks measured then? Okay, well that makes things nice and easy. Ten. And let's put five about here, just to save time. Okay. A thousand, wait a second, so a thousand grams is your top max, and ten newtons is your maximum. So I assume that that, that ten newtons was a measurement of that thousand gram max. Okay. So put a, a dot right there. Okay, and then um, after that, uh, it wasn't a thousand grams, and it probably would have been something. Uh, five hundred. Five hundred. Okay, great. So we have a five hundred gram mass. All right, and what was the Newton measurement there? Five. Okay. So we'll plot a point you guys there. Work over there? Yeah. <laughs> the reference. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this table is oh, sorry. We got it all graphed. I said right. five. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then the next mass down from a thousand and five hundred was. Oh, yes. Yes. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I was answering. <laughs> Two hundred. Okay. And uh, what? Did, what was the Newton measurement for that, that those 200 grams? Two. Two. Oh, wait a second. I think I'm beginning to detect a pattern. However, I'm not ready to call it yet. I think I need more data still. So let's get at least one more measurement. So um, after the 200 pound or the 200 uh, gram mass, what was the next one down? 100 and I wait. One Newton? Yeah. Yeah. So what gives? Why is it so difficult for us to keep track of mass and weight, even though they're clearly different quantities? What's actually happening here? So um, what I'd like you to do right now is just turn to the folks that you worked with and discuss your answer to that question based on the data that you got and the relationship that we've described between those, why is it so hard to keep them straight? Go ahead, talk it out. It's, it's absolutely required in science. Um, so, in this uh, in this case, can can somebody make a uh, offer us some ground, some conclusion that they've drawn on that we could use for further discussion? Now, we're not even going to have time for further discussion, but let's just put it out there. What do you, what is it about mass and weight that makes it so difficult to keep them straight? Yeah. I think the mass. Man, I'd really like to lose some weight. Doesn't it have something to do with volume, though? Yeah, that's next class. But, I mean, it, it, can, you, can you see why on earth it would be easy to interchange those words and not throw anybody off when there is this, this very, uh, when there's this, such a consistent relationship, we can get away here on Earth talking about weight and mass as being the same thing. But, you know, if I go out into space or into the moon or basically any place off the surface of the Earth, it's going to be really difficult 
to talk about both of those and um, interchange them because they're not going to be related like this in the same way. And so that's a, a little taste of how, we, how we've set up the class to approach problems like this. And um, let's take you on to I have another. A question. Oh, yeah. So if, you're, if we're on the moon and the gravity's like one sixth of what it is here, how, how is the relationship? Why is the relationship going to be different? Okay. That's what I'd like to know. Right, so um, let's see. If, are you saying, why is my weight different on the moon? No, why so, is the relationship between mass and weight? The graph we have now, oh, would okay. it be different on the moon? I see, so actually, will, let's say I did the same experiment on the moon with, this, with the spring scale, and the same masses. What would people predict I would get there? Would it be a line just like that? So we would still be like our, our weight, the, the proportions would be the same. It would be that still that same directly proportional relationship. But if I did half the experiment here and then half on the other one, then I've totally thrown things off. Yeah. Okay, um, I have definitely consumed the time that I have been allotted. Um, thank you very much. Um, and. Uh, Mr. Norton, Scott Norton is going to be here to take us through um, another experience which deals with plate tectonics. Yes. Thank you. So one of the fundamental shifts of the next generation science standards is the requirement that students are expected on a fairly regular basis to uh, use, interact, and you know, interpret computer simulations and models. So what we're going to show you here tonight is okay, an example of one of those types of simulations. This is one on plate tectonics. Uh, the theory of plate tectonics is to earth science what the theory of evolution is to biology. Okay, it is the unifying theory, the unifying force, and as scientific theories go, it is relatively young. It's only 50 years old. All right, so it's something that's still being worked out. Now, traditionally, when you're talking about plate tectonics with your students and trying to get them to understand what's going on, you had to rely on things like cutting things out with pieces of paper and, and gluing them, looking, okay, well, this coastline kind of matches up with that one, so I'm gonna put this here, or maybe some clay, and moving that around. But it was really hard for the students to get a good understanding of actually what's going on with the dynamics of the plates. So this is why these simulations are such a powerful learning tool. So the activity I'm gonna briefly walk you through is something that actually took two full blocks to do. It's got two parts. Uh, the first part has to do with their learning about the two basic types of crust, that being oceanic crust, and the other one being continental crust. And the other part, the second day part, is about the plate dynamics. So I'm going to pass out the actual handout to you, but we are not anywhere going to try to uh, do all of it. Thank you. So what we have up on the screen right here, and I apologize to those of you who have to turn around and look at it, is basically an illustration of the Beer's crust. And over on the left, you have the oceanic crust, and over on the right, you have the continental crust. Now, on the front page of that handout that Mr. Woodward is, is passing out is a table that the students have to fill out based on the characteristics. So what they have to fill out on there, okay, is the thickness of the crust, okay, its temperature, and its density. And they're actually given some little tools which allow them right, to actually measure this. So for example, to measure thickness, they just hold this ruler out of the And there they go. Except, came up, there it goes. And we don't want to measure the water. And then you can go over and measure the continental crust. 
but I think most of you can see that okay, the continental crust okay, is significantly thicker than the oceanic crust is. So we'll put our ruler back. And next, we'll go with temperature. So here is the temperature of the oceanic crust. Here is the temperature of the continental crust. And one thing you have to be careful with the temperature scale here, and I, and I tell the students about this, is you know, you've got to put them all the same relative place because if you go and move okay, farther down into the continental crust, all right, the temperature is going to go up. So that one okay, can be a little misleading. Actually, what I had my students do is actually look at the temperature this way, because this is over where Ben's Firedale procedure <laughs> is. Uh, you, can, you can view the temperature. So this shows, okay, the temperatures. And again, it's tough to see on a screen, okay? So here's cool, here's warm, and believe it or not, it is the oceanic crust that is slightly cooler than the continental crust, but really not that much. And lastly is density. So there is all right, the density of the oceanic crust as composed to the density of the continental crust. Which one is greater? Oceanic. Oceanic is. Yes, quite a lot. That's going to be very important when we move on to the next part about the plate interactions. So basically this first part, we have learned that the ocean crust is thinner, right? it's slightly cooler, and what's very important, okay, it is denser than the continental crust. And that's going to be really crucial when it comes to the plate interaction. So let's move on to the plate interactions. So this is the second part. And what's really cool about this is you get to build your own plate interactions. So over here, okay, you have your choices. You could have continental crust, young ocean crust, and over here by the fire drill feature again is old ocean crust. So let's throw a few of these up here and see what happens. Let's start with oh, old oceanic crust here. Yeah, let's put a little oceanic crust in here also. All right, so what we have here is two sections of oceanic crust, okay, both the same age, should be about relatively the same density, and these arrows okay, give us the option in which way we can move it. And I'm going to click on the red one. So in terms of plate tectonics, when things pull apart like this, we call that okay, a diversion plate boundary because they're moving away from each other. And a place that occurs at, is at the mid-ocean ridges. So as they pull apart from each other like that, you're basically creating a thin spot, a weak spot in the Earth's crust. And what can happen is magma can come up from the interior of the Earth right, at that weak spot, creating new ocean and crust. So over time, what is going on is the old crust okay, is moving away. It's being pushed away by that new crust that's being made in the middle at the ridge. That's the concept of C4 spreading. Right? That is the mechanism that actually moves the plates around the surface of the Earth. So let's try something else. We set all that, and well, when we have an interaction between continental crust and old oceanic crust. Now remember what we said about okay, the relative densities here. So before I click this green arrow, do we have any predictions on what's going to happen between the oceanic crust and the continental crust? What are, what are some possibilities? What could happen? The oceanic crust will go underneath the continental crust. Why do you think the ocean crust is going to go under? Well, it's denser. It's denser. All right. So let's see if that is what occurs. And yes, that is exactly what occurs. So when you have okay, an ocean <coughs> plate, excuse me, 
uh, converging, because this process is called convergence, with a continental plate, all right, the ocean plate always, always, always will subduct. It will go under. And as it goes under, it's going to melt. And that's what you're seeing right here. And if this goes on for long enough, something else will form on the continent. Can anyone tell me what those might be? Volcanoes. Those are volcanoes. So, Mount St. Helens, right, on the west coast of the United States, that is what okay, provides the magma source for Mount St. Helens, right? The subducting Pacific plate going underneath the North American plate. Well, I think we've seen enough ocean plate. How if we put it in two sections of continental? All right. So we have some options here again. Well, let's let's push them together. So let's have convergence once again. Hmm. Possibly, though the Rocky Mountains has a very complicated geologic history on it. Mm -hmm. But yes, part of it is due to convergence. But probably a better modern day example is okay, the formal formation of the Himalayas, which is still going on to this day, where the Indian <clears throat> Indian Australian plate okay, is colliding with uh, the Eurasian plate. And the result is actually is both plates to a certain degree buckle upwards, creating a very, very high elevation mountain range. So there's one type of plate boundary I haven't showed you yet. And before we wrap up, let me do that. So we talked about convergence, okay, we talked about divergence, but one we haven't talked about is okay when they move side to side. So, well, I'm to do it. No, BCG. Yeah. Yes. All right. So we have two young oceanic plates here, and now. They are moving away from each other, okay? Sideways. Right. And on land, okay, this is what actually is occurring at okay, San Andreas Fault. San Andreas Fault is part of a much larger plate boundary where it's okay, actually a transformed plate boundary. So they're basically swiping each other like two cars do. So through this simulation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay, the students you know, learn a better appreciation of actually what's going on in terms of you know, the dynamics at the plate boundaries. And it really drives home that idea uh, that really what's driving it is all about density, which is what you were talking about earlier when you were talking about things you know, can be smaller but have a greater weight or be larger and not weigh as much. That's all about density. So that is a, what really is a driving force behind the tectonics, is density. Thank you. So we appreciate your coming and <clears throat> watching two sample lessons of our work in the new science course. Are there any questions? <clears throat> yes. Uh, um, with what Scott, what you did on the screen there, would you do it on the screen like that with students, or would the students be using that with their Chromebooks and doing that on their Chromebooks? Oh, uh, that specific simulation right there, Mr. Davidson, actually cannot be done on a Chromebook because it requires Java. Okay. You can't download Java, so what I did with my class is I took them to one of our computer labs. So they did, so they so said they each, did, each individual student got to play with that. But it's a lot more powerful when they can actually do it on their own. Does it take more time? Yes, it does, but it's a lot better learning experience for them to actually work through it on their own than me sitting up there guiding them through. Okay. Excellent question. So you're telling me that the mountains they get taller? Yes. Okay. Actually, the green mountains are still rising. Why do you climb one at night? <laughs> <laughs>
time around. So we've approved the June 30th. This was the wrap up of last June warrants. Uh, number 1240 and number 1241 in the amount of $15,490.54. Then September 21st warrants, which are the first ones of the school year, uh, number 345, 46, 47, 48, 49, 1051, 52, and 53 in the amount of $795,641.92. And then October 5th warrants of number 1054 through 1056, 1059, 1061 through 64 in the amount of $750,711.82. Um, there were no payrolls this meeting to approve, uh, but the other business that we talked about, um, we had several other topics, and one was the um, reviewing of uh, the Whetstone Village property that uh, um, the school owns uh, some property there, and we're um, starting to take a look at how we might uh, uh, do, do something with that property or um, make a change with it. and. Um, Sean and Frank met with the president of the Whetstone Village Association and uh, had an initial visit to uh, um, express our desires to perhaps make a, make a change over there. And uh, that will continue. There was nothing uh, officially recommended at that meeting. But we are um, taking a look at those. We actually have three very small and probably uh, questionably buildable, certainly lots over there that were purchased um, back uh, around early 2000s, I believe, and with the idea that we may perhaps do something with it in the building trades, but uh, that's probably not uh, the highest and best use at this point. So we'll keep you posted on that one. Uh, we also talked about um, the budget development reporting form. Um, Frank uh, has a little bit of a different approach to the way he shows expenses that's more of a standardized approach. And uh, uh, we everything was always done very, very well with, with Jim Kane, but it was, it was developed over the years the way he represented um, various expense items and so forth. And, Frank has proposed some revisions. It doesn't change the, the actual bottom line or anything, but it just <coughs> changes a little bit how we designate certain things. It'll be easier to read, and it'll be simpler, and it'll line up better with the annual report. So uh, we talked about that a little. He went through and explained 
um, how, how we divide up expenses by program, school, and function, and the summary report. <coughs> I thought it was, uh, I don't know if Mike and Sean were there, but I thought it was, uh, I, it was a little clearer to me how, how it all works. So, um, the other thing we talked about is the uh, budget planning timeline. And uh, we um, will be moving into that soon uh, with some review. <coughs> What's that? Oh, okay. We'll pass that out. Uh, timeline so you can see when we're going to be starting our review meetings. Administrators, I believe, are working on budgets now. They, they look a little tired, so. I think it's a real thing. More time than the Yeah. And I hope everybody stayed up to at least watch that one play that was such a. And I hope it won't be put into our. Lexicon of plays. It probably has to be used. Friday night yeah. was. Yeah. 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 Uh, at, at the appropriate time, I'd like to just speak to this. Okay, uh, all right, sure. Okay, uh, so that was basically what we covered at the um, finance meeting, and our next meeting will be Thursday, October. No. Wednesday. Wednesday, October 21st, right. It is the 21st. <coughs> but we move to Wednesday this time. Okay. Um, was there an SU, any SU finance activity that we SU need to talk about? SU finance didn't meet, but there was an SU meeting. I don't know if you're going to cover that. Or I wanted to cover, cover this first. And okay. then when we get to the, uh, yeah. yeah. So we, we do have a, a meeting coming up on the 28th, which I think is Wednesday. And we'll be doing an overview of the budget, the SU budget. And then we'll go to other meetings and show that this timeline with specific programs. Okay. So can I just take any Yeah, sure. You can do that. Yeah, so if you take a look at this timeline, you can see the headings on the top of the UHS with the dates and the topics. So Frank and I have started to work with the principals uh, last week on looking at the, um, you know, looking at enrollment, looking at staffing. So they'll be preparing some um, initial draft uh, information for us that will get plugged into the budget. Then, um, you know, we get the special ed service plan, uh, apply that to it. Uh, so we'll have a document around November 3rd through the 10th to review the first draft of the principles. And then um, the finance committee slash budget committee, their first meeting to review um, at 5.30 on the 19th. We'll be looking at BAMS and the Career Center budget at that point. Um, the next week on the 23rd, we'll look at the district-wide capital plan and senior high. And then on November 30th, we'll look at the special ed budget and the revenue budget. With the idea of um, we'll have a public meeting on December 7th and another meeting on the 4th, January 4th, and that's when we would typically approve the budget for a vote on um, the annual meeting on February 9th. So you can see this is a little bit condensed from what we've done in prior years because we, we I believe we had used to have five meetings, right. but now we're doing two budgets per, per meeting. Um, which I think we can still accomplish in a reasonable period of time without making the meetings too long. Yep. So it starts a little later than it has in the past, our, our part of it. So then if you just take a look at the next column, the WSCSU column, um, again, the same sort of inputs from administrators, and then as um, Russ mentioned, the um, first review for the SU Finance Committee will be on October 28th. Uh, kind of a general overview of the budget, and then those um, special topics on November 18th, the uh, central office, curriculum and grants, uh, December 2nd, special education, and then uh, December 9th, uh, actually that would be the SU finance approval because we would have our next SU board meeting on the next night on the 10th um, for the approval of that budget. And then on the right-hand side, you can see all the different districts, Brownwood Town, Dummerston, Guilford, Putney, and Burnham. Any questions? Okay. 
Thank you. Planning and policy? Has not met, but we do now have policies that have come down for review. We will be meeting before the next session, and there will be policies one for first reading. Next meeting. Did you say how many there are? I have four, plus I'll select a local board policy to add to the bundle. The uh, policies we have that came down are uh, F1, student conduct and discipline, F8, student medication, uh, H4, distribution of non-school sponsored literature in the schools, and F9, student alcohol and drugs. Not yet. Oh. Them now. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Teacher curriculum. Um, we met earlier this evening from six to seven, and we had a, a really great presentation um, from the Fine and Practical Arts Department related to a new class that they want to oh. add, a three D digital design and art class mm. that um, wants to be added. So we had a great presentation, I thought, from that, and we got to actually play with things and the TCC approved um, that moving forward with that and um, I think we just need to have the whole board feel okay about doing that too but five members of the board were at the TCC meeting and, got to, and we, we approved the creation of this new class. There's no budget impact to, the, to adding the new class because we already have the hardware and the software and the software is free for download for educational institutions and students, and we already have all the hardware that's necessary in-house. It'll just be an extra class that um, Braylon will teach, and they'll figure out the cycle in which that'll happen, but it's just adding an extra class and an extra component to what students can learn in the area of digital design and 3D printing. Does that need full board? Approval if it has no, no, no budget. generally there's no, no budget implications. Right, so no so. budget implications. But we want to let you know that we did that. Yeah. Which was <coughs> so we an interesting thing. Have great trust in the teacher curriculum committee. Thank you. And that's five out of nine board members. Right, so <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> yeah, and as the program of study is is developed, uh, you'll get a you get a copy of that. Right. See all the yeah, and then the reason why I mean it seems at first I thought it would seem a little unusual that's October and we're talking about a class for next year, but it's so that it can get to the program of study so that students can select it and things like that so that it can happen in the timeline to make that all the printings and all that good stuff. So. If you need a board member to take the class, I'd be happy to uh -huh. I, think, I think there's actually a line. Yeah. I think there's like five of us that are going to be ahead of you now. So, but we can see to put you on the waiting list. Okay. okay thank you, Ricky. Yeah. How about BAM's committee? Um, BAM's committee met this morning. Um, myself and Sean were there. We had a little bit of a, a scheduling snafu. Um, so technically we were there, but we didn't actually have a full meeting. So um, we will reschedule one in the future. Long day for you guys. Okay, WRCC has not met. We reported our last activity. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve consent agenda as I move, presented? I move we Laurie? approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Ricky. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed or abstentions? Seeing none. See consent Thank agenda is approved. Shot. And we move on to administrative reports. Let's see what fun order we'll take today. How about we still? Student Council and then High School, okay, we'll try to keep them together. Student Council, what's going on there? Thank you. Uh, we haven't done a, a whole lot in the last two weeks, but our new clubs that met at the activity fair are now in full swing. Uh, student Council is accepting student applications through October 27th, so we're excited to read through some of those and be working with new members, especially underclassmen as we progress forward through this year. Our Feed the Thousands 
campaign starts usually mid-November and ends that that'll end uh, the f first Friday before Christmas break. So we're we're starting to get into the swing of that and put together a presentation. Um, is there anything else you'd yeah, like to add? Seven things. I think you got it. Yeah, we meet Wednesday mornings, so we're looking to move forward on all of those things. So you're in a major recruiting. Oh, yeah, we have we have quite a few seniors this year, so we're we're looking to <laughs> replenish the stock. <laughs> <laughs> are those positions? Are those seats still elected by the class dates? No, the students who would like to be part of student council uh, submit an anonymous paragraph to our faculty advisor, who then presents those paragraphs to our full student council, and we read through them. And we, we only know the, the grade of, of the applicant who we are reviewing. And then we, we select uh, applications that we, we believe are particularly strong or uh, we, we tend to select grades that we don't have a high representat representation of in student council. And I remember they made that shift a few years back when there was what they perceived to be a need for like, more enthusiastic <laughs> um, body of students. I don't know how they were selected, but I know that the application process was, what, a couple of years ago now? Right, they, they, got, they changed it a few years ago to try to boast more interest, especially among younger students. And then there's a certain number of students per grade that would right. be, if there's that much interest and yes. support, then they would be elected or chosen. Okay, thank you. And we'll move right over to the senior high then. Okay. Thank you. So, um, several things going on at the high school. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that 19 of our VHS band members have earned acceptance into the Connecticut Valley District Concert Band, and five course members have earned the District Jazz Choir. Uh, that festival will be November 20th and 21st here at VHS. We alternate hosting every year. And it's great to have um, you know everybody from the Connecticut Valley come down here and spend two days uh, doing band doing band concerts and uh, enjoying each other's company. Um, our career expo, the, you know, the Wyndham Workforce is doing a career expo this Thursday from one to five, and we've put on a major push with our counseling department. And I want to come to acknowledge the work they've done to get us ready there. Um, they're offering workshops to students on things like how to dress for an interview. Um, how to interview, what kinds of questions do you ask at an expo, and uh, we have 70 students attending those workshops over the next day, mm -hmm. and uh, a total of about 100 BOHS students will be attending the expo between 1 and 5, and those are students in grades 10, 11, and 12, so we're, we're pretty excited to have that turnout, and um, yeah, I just want to thank the folks at the expo for um, having it here, because for a lot of our students, it's a chance to really look at what they might do um, after high school if they're not thinking about going right to college. Um, so we're excited for that. Mm -hmm. I would um, like to acknowledge the fact that Steve, Keith, and Michael have worked really closely with David Alstead, who is the main organizer, to make sure that not only the UHS, Career Center students, and BAM students are really part of the program. So that's great work. In, in several area high schools are sending students as well, so it's, a, it's great. Um, we had our parent conferences last Thursday. Uh, they, went, they were pretty well attended. Um, as I mentioned in my last report, I've begun to talk to some other principals about how they structure parent conferences, and I've been surprised so far to find out that um, a lot of them do something similar to what we do, um, but that a significant number of high school principals in the area, they don't run a parent conference at all. Um, I'm not really a fan of that. Um, so we're going to continue to, to look at that issue and, and kind of see what we can do. But, um, you know, I was kind of hoping to get a great idea from somebody, but there wasn't anything that came out. Um, I want to acknowledge Meneth Goldschmidt Sauer. She's an English teacher here. Um, she was acknowledged by the Wonder Institute and had one of her essays called The Yellow Line um, accepted as a, as a winning entry. Um, she received an award for that. Um, she was asked to write about something that inspired awe and wonder. And I would ask you if you want to read that. It's a fairly short essay. It's called The Yellow Line. And uh, it's very compelling. And uh, it's a great read. And it shouldn't take too long. 
Um, Where can also, we see that? Uh, if you go to the Wonder Project, just Google the Wonder Project. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll have a 2015 entry list and you just click on her name. Okay. So, What's your name again? Uh, Beneth Goldschmidt Seller. Um, it's great to kind of see a practitioner, you know, like our art teachers are often also active artists and you know, they have shows and you can see them downtown. It's nice to see an English teacher having some work juried by her peers and accepted as, as being excellent. So um, <laughs> we're very proud of Beneth. Uh, also last week, BUHS TV, um, was acknowledged by BCTV as a community partner uh, of the year last year. And um, I want to acknowledge the hard work that Toby Moore, Allison Cram, Liz Denord, and uh, Peter Canazero do in supporting that program and keeping it vibrant and making sure that um, our content gets out to BCTV. I also want to acknowledge Roland and Core and everybody else at BCTV for the work they do, um, helping us uh, with technical stuff, but also encouraging us to continue to send content to them. Um, it's a great connection and we're very proud of it. Uh, fall sports, uh, track still has a few games left, or a few meets left, and uh, I think they have two more regular season ones. Um, other sports are beginning the playoffs. Um, you know, I'm proud that both of our soccer teams are um, in the playoffs, <coughs> as is our field hockey team. They had a very dramatic win Saturday, and it was great to see. And our football team will host uh, a playoff game, or play down game, this Friday against uh, Champlain Valley. So we're excited for all of our athletes and the work they're doing. Um, lastly, uh, Wednesday, I, I mentioned this last week, and I, I guess I want to mention this again. I think it's very important. Um, on Wednesday at 6 o'clock in the multipurpose room, we have a, a woman named Melissa Fernal, Fernarold, and she's a licensed drug and alcohol counselor, and she will be here setting up a mock teenage class, a teenage bedroom. And I think it's minus the dirty laundry. Um, but that uh, bedroom will contain over 70 items that may indicate that a teen is involved in some high-risk behavior. Um, that may be underage drinking, substance abuse, cutting, uh, eating disorders, or um, any other of the high-risk behaviors we worry about with our students. So attendees will get a chance to look and kind of figure out which of those items are high-risk items, where they come from, and then the presenter will kind of share an overview of slang terms, We'll talk about how to talk to our teens about addiction, how to talk to our teens about high-risk behavior. And uh, you know, I encourage all of our families, um, the parents, to attend. Uh, I think it's a great program. Um, it was offered at another area high school, and I attended, and I found it to be very useful. Um, it begins at um, 6 o'clock, and the presentation itself begins at 6.30. So I would think it. it is uh, Wednesday um, in the multipurpose room. This Wednesday. This Wednesday. So, um, it's a great opportunity to kind of uh, learn from some experts in the area. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Let's go will, back. Will we be invited to come to that? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Let's get back to Mr. Long. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so, just a couple um, things to uh, review. Um, uh, <clears throat> semi-minor, the big picture, some of them. Uh, we, we started instituting daily announcements again, um, which I don't know, I assume that they were at BAMS at some point, but I found that we, we had no way to communicate events to kids other than writing them on a board as they entered school and um, maybe website and stuff. So we implemented a um, daily announcement thing that's being read in, read in advisories now and hoping that it just improves um, student you know communication to students and you know promoting events and those kind of things um, we've begun uh, extensions which is an after-school um, kind of support uh, help time for kids on Mondays and Wednesdays basically progress reports went out and students who uh, were receiving essentially poor grades are kind of assigned to go to extensions and if they're on a sports team they have they get this thing called the pass to play if, uh, they have to go to extensions in order to be able to practice. That's essentially our eligibility plan for our after-school programs. And so that's begun and working out any, any kinks with that and some systems to make sure it goes smoothly. Um, taking advantage of our, uh, our um, well, alert now system, it's called Blackboard Connect, but uh, kind of notifying parents if their child doesn't show up for extensions um, through that system, and so far so good. 
Um, we had an in-service on the 8th of uh, October. Uh, it was a half day, and uh, it was with Rachel from the Taren Institute, and it was focused on personalized learning. Um, she, she made a, a great presentation on grit and resiliency and, and the importance of teaching that with kids, identifying it, and um, trying to teach them the value. Also around the growth mindset, which is kind of, um, you know, there's some new literature out around growth mindsets, uh, which I won't bore you with, but we talked about that. And also working on goal settings for their personalized learning plans. And uh, interesting presentation, um, the recent trend with goal setting is to create SMART goals. Um, it's an acronym. And there's a new, um, a new way of setting goals called WHOOP, which uh, stands for uh, wish, outcome, obstacle, and plan, the WHOOP. And so it's a, it's a, it's just a, it's a different way to create goals. And uh, our goals are focused on one of our transferable skills, uh, communication, and they're, they're set also setting personal goals. Um, so they're doing lessons on how to write goals. Um, and those are going into PLPs. I mentioned last time our website's being rebuilt and uh, Allison Cram, who uh, works at the high school, is rebuilding that for us and um, I'm excited for it. It's going to be a little more simplified. It's uh, going to be built, built through Google Sites and um, I haven't seen a draft yet, but I know she has one about ready. And then uh, just going back to the Career Expo, our eighth grade will be going over to the Career Expo. We're excited about that. and. Um, uh, the credit goes to our counselors, uh, BAMS, Paula Starkweather, and Carrie Sullivan, who've worked with the teams to put this together, and also um, Peggy Maxfield, one of the one of the uh, core teachers who um, helped organize the day. So we're excited about that. That's uh, what's that? Wednesday? Thursday? Thursday. Thursday. So that's all I got. Any questions? You uh, you wouldn't bore us with growth mindset, but could you? Just yes. Uh, a quick thing on growth mindset, it's essentially your outlook. It's having a, um, so if somebody says I can't do something, it's more essentially taking the approach you haven't learned how to do it yet. Um, it's that thinking positively, thinking, um, uh, just having a different outlook on, on things. I don't, that's about as simple as it comes. Yeah, it, it's the idea that intelligence isn't a fixed commodity yeah. for students and that Rather than say, I can't do this, we say, I can't do that yet. Um, so the idea that students can grow and change over their time. There's a lot more. It's obviously way more in depth than that. But there's a lot of research that says that children and adults who have that growth mindset achieve at much higher levels. That was evident when we did our lessons earlier. <laughs> <laughs> all all the the science science class class here. To what we were able to accomplish tonight. Brilliant. Could I just mention to uh, Keith, next meeting on November 2nd, Keith is going to be doing an overview of the BAMS uh, program to the Guilford Central School Board. And so he won't be able to be at this meeting. Uh, and Sean, I'm hoping that you might be able to attend that meeting as well at 6.30 at yeah, the I Guilford School. Um, yeah. I think they're very interested in you know um, hearing about the BAMS experience for their students. I know Keith is going to bring a couple of students and some staff from BAMS to the Guilford um, School, and I think it'll be really informative for um, Guilford parents um, to kind of check in on how things are going. So that's Monday, November 2nd, I believe. 2nd, and that's 6.30 or? 6.30, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, Vaughn, why don't we do that in Guilford, not necessarily in Vernon, because Guilford's still on the cusp of sending the children here? Yeah, they still have a uh, seven-year agreement to tuition kids in as opposed to joining the union. So um, I think they, you know, since it's only been, what, two years, they want to get a sense of how things are going. It might be something you want to initiate Vernon at some point too, to, as they have the option to go to Pine Man. I think, I think they do, actually. Yeah. Well, we do stuff with the students. If we go there and we, you know, we have a whole process we go through um, with transitions. And, the, and they, do they come here? They come here as well, but uh, you're talking about the board addressing the board. Well, like the yeah. We do a lot. Yeah, we do a lot with the with the kids. Um, well, from my perspective, we do a lot. 
So that might be something to look at to mm -hmm. plan a You do something similar similar in Dover too, right? I uh, probably to a lesser degree. They have a re kind of a recruitment night where they have like their gym open and, they, the, school and school the school set that. up little displays. Yeah. But um, yeah. We have a nice trend with Dover kids right now. It's encouraging. Okay. Thank you. Career Senate? Thanks, Mike. Tomorrow, the FBI, our Future Business Leader of America organization, will hold its fall blood drive in the high school NPR room. So if you, I think there's a few spots open if you're willing and able, stop by and give some blood. This uh, semester, Amy Anthony, our engineering, one of our engineering teachers, has created a relationship with GS Precision and set up weekly uh, tours of the wonderful plant they have over there. So her kids get a nice in-depth look of what goes on there. So it's broken down in weekly uh, visits. For example, they go over, they'll go over uh, three access milling one week uh, electrical discharge machining, finishing, plating, and programming within a 10 week period, which is a great exposure for our students to see what really goes on in an engineering firm. Tomorrow our uh, forestry teacher, Mr. Hamilton, and his students will be traveling to Randolph to VTC for the annual soils competition. and. Uh, Looks like it's going to be a little chilly <laughs> in Randolph. And uh, Dennis has been, I think, 22 years participating in this competition. So good luck to him and his students tomorrow. The Career Expo, as uh, Steve and Keith spoke about, is Thursday. And all of our students during uh, ACE block and fourth block will be attending the uh, third annual Career Expo. It'll be held in the high school gym and NPR room. And our students have been practicing interviewing skills with WRCC's counselor, Ann Doran, and our uh, new co-op coordinator, Ray Dunn, and practicing mock interviews within the different areas of the career center. It's been really enjoyable for the students to be involved with what's right and what's wrong when, when it comes to an interview. So they should be uh, very well prepared for this experience, great experience. Our WRCC ambassadors, led by Betsy Gentili, has already begun this year. And we could, that group consists of 20 students representing the different programs within the Career Center. And they normally, in the springtime, to, uh, tour the sending school students and middle school students around our programs. But Thursday for the Career Expo, they're going to guide the 358th graders that will be joining us and giving them their professional aspects of what to do within an expo setting. So good luck to them and kudos to Betsy Gentili. Acting uh, will be attending Northern Stage in White River Junction this Wednesday to see our town. So it looks like a fun show. Mm -hmm. Any questions? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Central office. I'll wait till we get to that meeting and okay. we have two items under unfinished business. Okay. Uh, the board chair has nothing at this point. Uh, so we move on to unfinished business and we do have uh, at least two items there and Ron I believe you have something for us that we need to move on. Yeah to, I have a uh, motion for the, um, let me just read it to you and uh, we can have some discussion. Uh, it would be to move to continue to be a member of the PV Consortium of Vermont Supervisory Unions and authorize the consortium via its agent. Competitive Energy Services LLC to negotiate on the district's behalf net metering agreements with various developers to receive discounts no less than 30% on the electric rate uh, charged 
the district by green loan power. So this is the next step because we, not too long ago, um, approved becoming involved with a consortium, right? Yeah. And this is the next step, which is to begin to move ahead to negotiate a contract. Right. So the exciting thing is no less than 30% savings uh, for your electricity, which is really great. Wasn't it 32% at one point? Um, this thing no less than. Right, okay. Frank has a projection that is higher than 32, probably closer to 30. Which is higher than when we first started oh, talking yeah. about it. I think we were talking more in the 20, 20, 20 range. 20 yeah. percent. I mean, yeah. And the uh, Amherst Town has uh, 10, so that's, no, it's good. So are we approving the contract that was? No, you're just approving. Continuing. Continuing. Oh, okay. And Frank should have sent, I think you all received uh, an attachment uh, in email probably a week ago or maybe a little earlier than that. Or I had the diagram. So I thought, yes. Mm -hmm. With the list of questions, typical questions. Mr. Chair? Yes. I move to continue to be a member of the PV Consortium of Vermont Supervisory Unions and authorize the consortium via its agent Competitive Energy Services LLC to negotiate on the district's behalf net metering agreement or agreements with various developers to receive discounts of no less than 30% on the electric rates charged the district by Green Mountain Power. Sorry. Second. Second. Okay. Uh -huh. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Or abstentions? I abstain. I don't understand this whole thing at all. I'm not going to vote on something I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> you've abstained and you've given your reason for abstaining. Okay, we have one abstention. and. Uh, we move on to the next item, which is Act 46 discussion. So, uh, as Russ mentioned, we had an SU uh, board meeting last Tuesday. There was a lot of discussion about, uh, well, there wasn't a lot of discussion about Act 46, but um, we are um, now, all the boards, individual boards, have voted to form a study committee, and that was needed, uh, the consensus of the boards to do that. So, what that represents is, um, each board will have uh, representation based on the equalized pupil numbers. And so the way it will work um, in this district is that um, because of the um, Brattleboro numbers, the town board would have six representatives, up to six representatives. Um, and then all the surrounding districts would have one. Uh, and that would be a total of 10 members. If we had a 10, a uh, nine member committee, then Brattleboro would have five. I know their, their board has already identified three board members that would like to serve on the study committee. I know they also have the option to um, uh, identify uh, board members from BUHS as part of that study committee. Um, there's two ways you can do it based on the statute. One would be board members from BUHS could be invited as ex officio members, or in this case, what we've chosen is um, board members from Brattleboro would, would um, BUHS board members from Brattleboro would, could serve on the committee. So I know um, Bob has indicated his interest in doing it. Um, I had hoped to get some of the outlying districts more representation by asking Michael and Sean to serve. But the statute is very clear that it has to be the proportion of Brattleboro um, you know, reps from, from that town. So that's not a possibility. Although when the study committee meets, or actually prior to that, um, we're gonna make a point about having ex officio members from other uh, our smaller districts. So uh, I really think it's important that um, Perception was that we don't think that there's five or six members from Brattleboro dictating what the other districts should do, especially in this this type of um, um, research in terms of the um, viability of uh, the options that we have. So I think that will happen. Um, the board chairs are meeting tomorrow at two o'clock. Uh, board chairs of all the district boards, um, just to kind of get a handle on the study committee rules and make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, 
and then from there uh, we will, um, I think we have a tentative date for the study committee, which is November 5th, uh, probably at 6 p.m., something like that. So we'll just keep you informed on the process, but I know uh, Bob will be meeting tomorrow. I think you're, you're coming, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, great. So uh, Bob, along with the other board chairs, will um, discuss this further so we make sure that we're all straight and going forward. So I have a question. question. So the town school boards are invited to be on the study committee, but the BUHS board is not? That's right. Based on the statute, which is it's actually um, not necessarily initiated under Act 46. It was really under uh, Act 53, 153, and 156. Again, governance statutes. Uh, let me read that section to you. Um, where a union high school, well, prior to that I should read, um, the number of representatives uh, does not need to be precisely proportional, but should be reasonably aligned with proportional number of equalized pupils. So in other words, Brattleboro Town has, Brattleboro has most of the students, and then you have Dummerson, Putney, Guilford, and Vernon, with probably between 10 and 13 percent of the students. So that's where you get the five or six to one. Uh, and then for the Union High School, the passage is where a Union High School exists, the students from that school should be counted as part of the number of equalized pupil for their respective towns. So in other words, all of the BUHS kids are divided up into their their origin town. Um, that the school should count as part of the number of equalized people for their respective towns. An option is to include up to X members of the Union High School Board as ex officio members of the committee with full participation rights but no voting rights. When considering representation on the study committee, boards may also consider appointing members from the Union High School Board as representatives of the Town Incorporated School District Board. So that's the one we're choosing, that um, Brattleboro in this case could decide that they want to give two or three slots to BUHS reps from Brattleboro to serve on the committee. And I think that makes more sense than just having ex officio members that and don't that, have any voting rights. And that decision making capacity lies with the Brattleboro Town School Board? Right, that's right on how to go about filling its seats? No, just offering those seats. And then it's really up to you guys in terms of your availability and interest. I think what I'm trying to determine is does the BTSD have the power to decide if it's offering seats ex officio versus? Yes, ultimately they do. Okay. But they have decided to do it as voting members. And then this board, Ultimately, in deciding consolidation or not, doesn't vote. Is that oh, that's right? right? It's just the right. just the town board. Just the district boards, as, yes. as opposed to the union high school board. Right. right. So was was Act one fifty three and fifty two in conjunction with forty six, or is that an existing governance? It's it's new governance that were were passed previous, you know, five years ago, three years ago, and then Act forty six is the latest. Right. X, Act forty six is referencing these. Yes. Past. Yep. Okay. So the study committee, uh, you know, will we'll look at all of the uh, options and look at the pros and cons. Uh, they make a report to the state board. Uh, they will keep their individual boards uh, apprised, but it doesn't go to a vote to the individual boards. It actually goes to a vote to each town. Mm -hmm. So if there was a uh, consensus to do the preferred structure, which would, you know, do the consolidation for next year, each town meeting uh, would need to vote affirmative to that. If that didn't pass, then the second year there's what they call a conventional model, which um, you know it might be the member districts that want to consolidate. Um, the third option that the committee will look at is the alternative structure, which essentially maintains the way RSU is um, functioning right now. But you have to make the case that we get the same benefits that we would have in a consolidated um, uh, school district, and that that might be tough to do. And, and right presently, there are not the financial incentives that are under the preferred or conventional. And that's uh, an area I think <coughs> discussion 
with uh, legislature sure. too will be the uh, um, alternative structure, uh, not having the uh, inability to get the tax incentive. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so the makeup of a, the new consolidated board would generally what would the cons what would the makeup be? It, I mean, you know, if it, if it was the preferred or the conventional pre K twelve board. Kind of an operating board like this, representing each school district, um, but you know, probably a nine to thirteen member board. It would be proportional, just like this is, where we have five Brattleboro reps and then one for the um, outlying towns. Uh, <coughs> it would operate in consensus, as this board has. I think some people worry that Brattleboro will, will dictate what happens, but I always use this board as a good example that. You people are not necessarily looking at, you know, I, I know you're concerned about your own towns, but you're really more concerned about the students and the student opportunities. And so, um, you know, I, I would think that that board would operate in that way as well. We also talked about having school-based councils where uh, the board rep from each town, along with the principal and parents and community members, would, would form a committee or a board. Um, they wouldn't have the same power as a school board, but they certainly would be advocates for their local schools, which is kind of what happens now with school boards. Because quite frankly, when we set budgets and look at personnel, there's not a lot of discretion when we're uh, developing budgets if we want to operate a school with 15 to 18 students in a class. Uh, that's 80% of the budget or more. So, um, there were other questions? Yeah, I mean, when you, the council question. Yes. Um, when you envision these councils, or somebody's envisioned these mm -hmm. councils, I don't know who's thought of that. For I did, but the agency of that is taking my idea. Take it. Okay, so using us as the example. Yeah. Obviously, Guilford, Vernon, Dumbarton, Putney would each have their own council. Would right. you envision, envision like Brattleboro? Oak Grove would have a council, Greenshoe would have a council, Academy, BAMS, the WRCC, and the BUHS would all each have their own council, so there essentially would be, you know, yeah, that, I 10 mean, councils? Yeah, I, I could see, you know, the BAMS committee, the committee right. yeah. uh, uh, process that you have in place would make sense. Uh, WRCC has the, the regional advisory board, so that's a strong unit as it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I could imagine BAMS and VUHS having kind of a school-based council. Okay. Um, I don't know if every individual school might. They might. You know, Oak Grove has a pretty strong parent group, as does Academy and Green Street. So, you know, uh, with, with those individual principals, it probably makes sense to have it school-based. Because definitely the outlying schools will. Right. Yeah, so that probably would make sense. Would there be interest in towns outside of the WSESU? Um, if, if we do the preferred method uh, other towns cannot join in but in the second year they can and if we did a conventional other towns could join in again the second year which would be the convention. they will be part of the study committee no the, I mean uh, as an example Marlborough has shown some interest Dover and, and they're joining their own study committee in Wyndham Central um, that doesn't commit them to anything but um, just in terms of the, the uh, procedures in the legislation um, the preferred structure is only within your district now, your current district. If other people want to come in or consider coming in, then it would be in the second year. And the preferred structure has the largest uh, percent, or the, the 10 8 Yeah, it has the first or incentive being 10 cent reduction down to yeah. 8 cents. Yeah. Yeah. There's supposed to be cost savings derived from this yeah. structure. So someone's going to have to lose the job, right? You know, I, I, the example I look at is the special ed consolidation. We, it was a two-year process, and it took us finally this, this last year to consolidate. And we saved $300,000. Now, I don't, I don't, to attrition, you know, we didn't- yeah, I, can see special ed, excuse me, I can see how special ed can work that way, but either services or, or programs, I'm not- well, I, I can see small school yeah. staffing where staffing can be shared between school, two schools as opposed to you know, one school getting a two-thirds position, another school a 50% position, just as we did with special ed. So, so I some, think there's, there's some savings. Someone will have to travel or the students will have to travel or something like that. 
I don't know, we've talked too about, again, I think the study committee will look at this, is, is looking at some school choice options that for some students that their families live in Brattleboro, would it make sense for a percentage of students to be able to go to elementary choice and, you know, to the other schools as well. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we've started to put together a list of some of the benefits that we think we would see from this, and it's not just based on financial benefits. It's more programmatic, but um, Frank will be getting some AOE, um, um, not numbers, but models, financial models that he'll be able to apply to our own district, and, and that will give us a better sense of but, finances. But wasn't the state's, uh, the, wasn't the impetus for this to reduce local property tax? Or oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, to get some kind of cost yeah, savings yeah. out of this? Yeah. yeah. I think in a district like ours, there's probably not as much of savings, but in some of those districts where you have 10 different district boards, district schools, and some schools are pretty tiny, uh, it's going to make sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I'd like to see how it works. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And what part would the uh, structure uh, be made evident, uh, the structure of the board? So I'm sorry? Well, at what point would the structure of the boards, the structure of the governance, governments uh, be actually made known? I think we'll know that through the study committee. Yeah, I think, I think when we do public forums, we're going to need to know what that structure looks yeah. like. You know, so it, yeah, it'll, be, it'll be a pre-K to 12 board. Right. It'll be proportional. Right. You may... I don't think you were on the BUHS board then, but when I first started in this district, BUHS had an 18-member board. I was on for two meetings. Yeah, and, and but they probably missed people. like four meetings because they couldn't get a, a quorum. Yeah, there were, there were never 18 people. Yeah. Either, yeah. So one thing that happened <laughs> as a result of that is is the reconfiguration of a nine-member board that we've never missed a quorum. Uh, I don't believe since that's changed over in 2004. Um, so that'll be a consideration in terms of you, you have to have it proportional to your per pupil equalized students, but you can you can affix a number that's manageable or a higher number. And, and they recommend the state's recommending don't don't go over nine to twelve members. You won't, probably want an odd number, but you know if um, if we said okay, so let's let's have every town have two reps. Well then, Brattleboro is going to have ten reps, and you know you don't you don't want a situation where you have eighteen members for a board. Uh, I was on the these I'm guys don't have to worry because they don't have to go to the meeting. But I do. <laughs> I, I was I was on this board when it was like that yeah. for, for six months, and I never in the six months I never missed a meeting, and there was board members I never met. Yeah, because <laughs> they never came to one meeting in six months. So Sean, that question will be clear, you know, in terms of what the study committee would propose. So that's going to be I mean, potentially before the new year. Yeah, I, I mean, I think November, December is, is kind of a crucial time. We, well, we would have to have something ready for the third week in January if we're going to bring it to voters in March. So the warning period of yeah. 30 or 45. Whatever it is yeah. for our budget. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to have to move quickly if it moves. Are you garnering? So are you? Asking for people to volunteer if they're looking for people from this board from Brattleboro to be on the. I think we will be, yeah. I'd be really interested in being part of that. Any other interested members? I was going to say I would be, but if, if people are extremely interested, and I'm only interested in the extremely <laughs> interested. <laughs> On a one to ten scale of interest. <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm in the same boat with Laurie. Like, if there's people that are extremely yeah. interested, uh, but I'm in, I'd, I'd be interested as well. Okay. Yeah, I have some interest as well. Yeah. So, and so part I'm of already it, getting questions. So yeah. So part of it's going to be the study committee deciding the the numbers on the committee, and and we'll know. I, I think we'll have a better sense of that possibly tomorrow, and certainly by early November. We'll keep you appraised as we go. I just hope that they don't have only people 
who are for this thing on this committee because there are people out there who are not for it. I can guarantee you that the um, opposing viewpoint will be represented on the committee. Good. From Brown Brown. Uh, from, well, we'll ask you. Okay. Anything else under unfinished business? If not, uh, we have one piece of new business and I, oh, you have it as well? Okay. Um, I'll I just give you an idea that it's, it's one of the, we haven't done one of these in quite a while where we're asked to, um, uh, an Act 250 permit, we're act, asked to sign off that the impact of the project will not adversely in, impact our ability to deliver education. And uh, we, have a, we have one tonight that's as a result of GS Precision's decision to expand um, in Brattleboro. Uh, and I believe they, their plan will be ultimately to uh, add a, up to 150 new employees. And that impact on the school would be projected uh, to be a maximum of 35 new students over. That's a five-year period, right. I believe. Right. I may have exact numbers. I'm just going from memory. Um, yeah. Well, they have a predicted for yeah. five. Oh, yeah, that is right. Well, mine is a blind. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, 35 uh, over five-year period. Um, and it's actually, the projected number of jobs is 100. I've, I've heard from other sources that it probably will be more than that. So the 35 would be spread over BAMs and the UHS and WSCC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that would have virtual no impact. No negative impact. They're not all ninth graders. <laughs> no. Well, we don't know who they are yet because there would be people that have that are no, not yet employed by GS Precision. But uh, um, if you have a normal uh, curve of uh, ages, um, it would be spread out quite a bit over the over the schools and. Could be a lot of existing students as well. Well, well, yeah, it could be um, people switching jobs and so forth. But that'd be a net, definitely a net change in the number of number of jobs there, which there has been as they've been able to find um, employees over the last last few years. It's a growing concern, growing business, not a growing concern. Well, it's a growing concern too, I guess. <laughs> That's how you use the word concern. Okay, so um, is there if it, any, is there a motion, I guess, first off, to approve this uh, school impact questionnaire that has no adverse impact on the uh, BUHS? I move that we approve the school impact questionnaire as presented. Okay. Is there a second? And Russ. Okay, Russ. I have a question. Is that something that the superintendent completes or do you have staff um, or is it team? It's, it's, it's usually certified by me to yeah, answer this question. Yeah, it uh, says there somewhere, it says from the superintendent or appropriate school official, they also serve as evidence. So we are providing evidence to Ron we are they're approving or not approving, and he will sign the paperwork. So the question is, do these schools have the capacity to accept the additional students listed above? We would say yes. Do you have any com other comments? No. Are you available after sufficient notice to answer questions related to the above statement for Act 250 here? I would say yes. Do you have a list of criteria that you review in determining that? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed to abstentions? Okay. That's we have a consensus on that. Um, is there uh, any other new business that we missed? Mr. Chairman. We missed you the last time, Rose. Hearing none, I move that we adjourn.
Okay. Second. 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 No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Nay. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Yeah.